Welcome, folks, to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership I podcast. I have the distinct pleasure of being with Rodney Evans, who is the partner at The Ready. Rodney, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to chat with you. I love your podcast studio, homemade podcast <laughs> studio. Uh, you host a podcast. You do cool things. You've got cool experience. Tell people about who you are and what lights you up in the world. Okay. So uh, yeah, as, as we let in, I'm Rodney. I do organizational design specifically focused on the future of work. So I work with mostly big companies, but sometimes small companies and web three companies and DAOs and things like that to help them become more adaptive and more human. I live in Durham, North Carolina. I am the mom to two dogs uh, I podcast, I read tarot, I do house projects. That's a little bit about me. Sweet. And you've had some cool, you work with some cool organizations, Deutsche Bank for one, you are official co-pilot, according to your LinkedIn bio. <laughs> you've been an HR uh, CIO, chief innovation officer. You've done a lot of stuff, hey? I have. And especially, you know, when you look at me and you can see I'm obviously just basically right out of college. It's amazing. Um, yeah, no, I've I've had like a really a very cool 20 year career um, in all kinds of fields. And I think the through line of the things that I've done um, is just being really curious about a better way. And so, you know, I started in mid consulting and then I went to investment banking and then I did small consulting and I did my own thing. And, and basically like, I've just been kind of frustrated with the world of work throughout my career and just thought, you know, we spend most of our lives pursuing work. Uh, why does it suck so bad? And what could we do about it? And so now that's what I do for a living is help people try to find their way to something better. Cool. So how does in big organizations, how do you see the balance of big companies doing things because it helps the bottom line because it's just like a reorganization and they're doing it because it's cool versus the like, um, I don't know, people side of things like balance the people profit and putting in that org redesign. Where does that line sit and, and how do leaders uh, maybe move to the good side versus the evil side of reorganizations? Yeah, it's such a good question because to me, what you're articulating is actually foundational to what frustrates me. I feel like big organizations see things as either being about structure and bureaucracy and hierarchy and control and profit or something that feels like hair braiding and kumbaya and people oriented soft stuff. And to me, um, we shouldn't focus our attention primarily on either of those things. We should focus our intention, our attention on designing the system for what we want. Hmm. And what I mean by that is like, okay, if what we want say is more profit, if that's something that's really important to us right now, this quarter, for whatever reason, it's the most important. What are we trying? How are we working? And, and when I say how, what I find in big companies, especially is like, they get very focused on the what, very focused on like, we're going to change the wording in our strategy, or we're going to, we're going to like, you know, move these deadlines forward around this product launch, or we're going to change our pricing structure so that we can like get more with less. And I'm like, okay, like fine, but how, like, how are you making those decisions? How are you evaluating what's happening in the broader environment? How are you meeting? How are you hiring? Like the how to me is the magic in organizations. And it is the thing that is most often overlooked because we bring with us a century of just sort of like an implied way of doing stuff that doesn't serve us very well. And then we just concentrate on the what. Mm. So I have two questions, but I think the most leading one there is how do you feel about institutional power structures oh <laughs> um i feel like they're mostly broken and also i feel like they're mostly a lie so um so what what i think is that an org chart is a lie committed to paper basically because i've never been in an organization where work really gets done according to the lines and boxes on an organizational chart. Mm. And what bugs me about um, explicit power structures and things like org charts is when we have them and we like honor them, what we end up doing is organizing the work to be done around the structure. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And that doesn't make any sense. It just slows us down. And so when I, you know, when I was a manager in a company and I had to work cross-functionally, I, you know, I had to like observe the silo. And it was like, I had to talk to my boss so that she could talk to her peer so that she could talk to her subordinate rather than me just talking to the person I needed to collaborate with to do my job properly. And so what bugs me about those explicit power structures is that they slow us down and usually not for a good reason. Hmm. So like what I want to be the kind of organization design that I practice and that we practice at the ready is like, what is the work to be done? And then what are the roles or the skills or the tools that are required to do it? Can we just like put the org chart to the side for a minute and actually sprint on what is needed to make progress? So I think that, you know, things like org charts, and 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 a lot of the more traditional trappings of bureaucracy come from a factory floor. That way of working is 100 years old. You know, most of us are no longer in a factory making a widget. Most of us are doing knowledge work now, but we're still working like we are making widgets. Hmm. So, you know, Rodney, I hear that. But as a business owner, I'm really busy. You know, uh-huh. I don't want to spend time. Sure of, you know, adjusting this, it seems like a lot of work. Like why, why, why should I even bother? I mean, moving people around conversations, like I don't want other people to talk to each other, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, why should you? So, so what's funny is that, you know, this is, this is the same conversation that I have often early days with clients. Um, And you, my first answer usually is like, well, how is it working for you right now? And most business owners and most leaders and most people managers are in some state of overwhelm because the complexity that they're dealing with is too high for them to like know every detail and sort of command and control their way through the world. And, you know, they're, I, you know, coming from traditional organizations myself, I remember the days of like, if I showed up to the big meeting with the executives, even though I was just the person who had collected the data from 15 different people, I better know every number in that PowerPoint deck. And I better be able to anticipate every question that's going to be asked to me in that meeting. And And that just breaks like it just there's just two things are moving too quickly and there's too much information for me as a manager or a business owner to be so in the detail of every single person's work that I can control it or opine on it or manage it for real hands on. So so my answer to you is like, why bother? I'm like, why not bother? Bother because your life sucks and probably bother because you're overworking and probably bother because you can't actually stay ahead of things. And also bother because you probably hire smart people and you probably hire adults who make huge decisions all day long in their lives about having kids and buying houses and caring for sick relatives. And then you put them inside a company and you tell them they can't spend $10 without your approval. And that doesn't feel like common sense. Hmm. Uh, Do you ever encounter people having, well, it's kind of a business case question, but it's less around a business case. And I'll, I'll bring it back to myself is I spent eight years of my work trying to convince people that they had a problem that I already saw, but they couldn't Mm. see. How how do you communicate that to people if they don't even see it as a problem? Like, how do you walk in and tell them maybe they don't realize that organizational design, it's not that their organization design sucks, is that it's just underperforming for their potential, probably. How do you get people to see that when they might not even recognize they have a problem or might not even know that organizational design and the ready are a solution? It's a really good question. Um, and it's it's actually something that I would say we weren't very good at at the beginning because some of these things felt really self-evident to us as people who do this for a living and also like as nerds who are really interested in this. And what we what we had to really evolve to over time was recognizing that like clients are really good at doing their jobs. They're not necessarily good at org design day one. And so you have to create enough, like enough support and scaffolding for them to learn enough about org design and systems thinking to do, to, to make change. And so one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that we do at the very beginning of a lot of engagements or workshops or whatever is we have this like deck of cards 
There's 78 of them um, called these aren't Tensions. Tar- these aren't tarot cards. These they're, are different they're cards. They're not, but there are 78 tarot cards in a deck too. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't say. It's huh? not coincidental. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and so these 78 cards have things on them like there are bottlenecks in decision-making, our budget doesn't reflect our reality, we're too slow to plan, um, you know, we have a gender imbalance, uh, we have too many meetings, it's unclear who can make decisions. These are just, they're, they're, they're things that we just see time and time and time again. And so to your question about how do you make people see a problem, rather than us going in and being like, bureaucracy and factory floor and complexity theory and systems thinking and blah, 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 we're often like, here are, here are 78 things. Where does it hurt on mm-hmm. you? And I truly have never been in any group in my life where people go, no, 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 none of these things apply to us. And so it's like once you once you have something, you know, when they pick the card that says our strategy is unclear and they rally around that, you're like, OK, let's start there. Let's start with where it hurts and figure out what we could try and run an experiment. And truly, that is all org design has to be is what is what is holding you back from doing your best work? What could you try that you haven't tried before? And what is an eight week experiment that you could run to see if it makes your life better? Cool. I love that. Uh, Are you from North Carolina originally? I am not. I grew up in Connecticut and then I lived in Manhattan for a decade. And then we decamped to Durham, North Carolina about 10 years ago. Is there a lot of people who need org, org design in North Carolina, or is it a function of that's where home is? And then everything, you know, everybody, you move around, you go see people. Yeah. What's that regional work like for you? It's a great, it's a great question. I have no idea. I, before the pandemic started, I was on a plane like 40 weeks a year. So mm-hmm. uh, I very rarely have worked with local clients. I think the truth about like who needs org design is once, once you're sort of, Once you can like see through the matrix of the system and the ways that systems are failing, the truth is that it's everyone. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I'll get to know someone and talk about what I do and how I do it. And they're like, I need you for my family. Or like, we need you for our community meeting. Or like, we need this for our HOA. One of my clients who I worked with for a long time at a very large um, education company started using meeting practices that she had learned working with us at her co-op meetings for her West Village apartment building because she was so sick of going to these co-op meetings and just having them last for hours and be circular and having no decisions be made and not having role clarity. And, And so she just like brought those things in. So it's like, Anytime you have more than one person working on a thing, you have some complexity. And anytime you're dealing with complexity, having a little bit of explicit org design probably will help. So Great. yes to North Carolina, but also yes to everywhere. Cool. I like that. And one of the things, listeners, you might not have picked up on, or maybe I'm looking into it. You use the word matrix when you look into someone's matrix, which I believe you meant in the most literal sense, as in how do things intersect? But if anybody's seen the movie Matrix, you don't know you're in the matrix. You have to have somebody tell you that you're in the matrix. And I bet that's probably the same with poor organizational design. You might have the feeling like something is off, but you might not know what it is. So somebody needs to like pull you out of it and give you the option to say, well, do you want the red pill to go back to your comfort? Or do you want the blue pill to be able to like have that like future where you're fully in control? And Rodney, I believe that's probably what your organization does. Some version 100%. of 100%. And we use the red pill, blue pill thing all the time. Oh, trippy. All cool. the time. Okay, yeah, because you're that's that's exactly right. Because it's like you can't see through the matrix until you can see through it. Hmm. And I know, like, um, and and I'd be curious if this is true for you. I know when I worked for big companies, you know, my first internship was with the Gartner Group when I was like in I don't know in college, some big company, and then KPMG, and then Deutsche, Bank, big companies, and I didn't know that there was a different way to do stuff. I was just like. This is how hiring works. This is how job descriptions work. This is how promotions work. This is how comp works. Like nobody ever told me that Mm. there were alternatives to traditional ways of working. So I might have felt like emotionally frustrated, but I didn't cognitively think like someone is choosing to do it a way that is suboptimal. I was just like, this is the way it's done. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Is that how you feel in big orgs or around big orgs? I I mean, it's interesting because I had never worked for a big organization. So the con, the pro was I was not limited by the structure that somebody put on me as in like the elephant tied to a post. 
kind of idea. But then the flip side is I didn't know the better way to do it. So I was just doing it my own way. So uh, there's pros and cons to each. Um, so it's interesting. But then I see, you know, I talk to so many people on the podcast that I start to learn some of the things. And whether you're a big organization or a small organization, eh, it's the kind of same thing, just a different flavor. Uh, but yeah, yeah, question. exactly. And and we often joke that, not joke, because it's horrible, but uh, we often say like, you know, there's a spectrum and, and on one end is bureaucracy and that sucks. And on the other end is chaos and that sucks too. Like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> like neither feel great when you're in them. And in one case, you're seeking permission and the other case, you're seeking influence. And neither of those states feels very empowering on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a very cool reflection. So folks, where are you on that where spectrum? And, and, and see, if, is it serving you? And I think that's where it really comes down to it. If it's serving you, great. And if it's not serving you, if you still have pain, then you know, that's a problem. Uh, Rodney, uh, obscure question, because I love obscure questions. What is the thing that you love to talk about that if we were at a dinner party, you would not stop talking about it, but you so rarely get to share this like little piece of knowledge that you're super passionate about? Uh, maybe it relates to leadership and team development. Maybe it's has to do with home decor or something obscure. Anything on your list that you just love talking about, but don't get enough chances to? Oh my gosh, how long is this dinner party? Because there's so many things. Um, I would say the thing, because I do so much like systemic work, I used to also do a lot of coaching. I used to a lot of, do a lot of individual coaching and I've had a lot of coaching in my career. Um, like, thank God. <laughs> um, I think the thing that I can really nerd out about for a long time is is ego stuff and like cultivating self-awareness and cultivating psychological flexibility. And I used to do a lot of coaching and speaking and talking on those topics. And I haven't in a long time because I've gotten so focused on systems things and, um, and I miss it. And if anybody wants to nerd out about like ego and identity, that is a place that I will go forever. Cool. Well, that's probably it. You know, you mentioned through lines originally that it's just an ego of an organization that you're helping people like reflect and check in on so that they can be like, oh, yeah, is this my true self or an imagined self that I really Yeah. Want? Yeah, Anyways, that's cool. It won't go what's, there. Oh. What's your weird dinner party topic? Oh, man, I don't know if I have. It doesn't one. have to be weird, but just, you know. Uh, I, well, it's funny because nobody wants to talk about strategic planning. They just always have someone else more important to talk to. So as soon as I mention I do strategic planning, they have like somebody more interesting. I like video games. I got to interview a guy who talks about video games, but most people don't want to hear about my war zone exploits because I'm not very good. So that's not, it's a pretty short conversation, but. Well, so I will point you, I will shamelessly flog my own podcast because the episode that dropped last week is uh, my co-host and business partner, Aaron and I talking about how our work relates to our hobbies. My mm. hobby being um, playing the cello. I was almost a classical musician by profession before I diverted and did other things. And his being playing video. I don't even understand enough about video games to say the words properly for first person video yeah. games where yeah. you get like put in a lobby and then you form a team and then you Sweet. go do stuff. Yeah. Um, and so we dedicated a whole episode to talking about like how org design relates to being in groups that don't have a hierarchy. Say, hmm, interesting. Okay, I'm going to listen to that podcast. Since okay. you're the guest, you can shamelessly plug anything you want. Okay. I've been trying to shamelessly <laughs> plug you for this whole time. Uh, <laughs> but you should check out our last podcast guest whose name escapes me right now, but it was an awesome conversation. Uh, last question, maybe. You talked about ego. You talked about learning a lot. Was there a moment in your career that you got your ass handed to you and you're like, whoa, what a great lesson that I that has shaped how you look at teams, how you look at yourself, how you look at organizations um, that you bring into your clients that you work with now? Oh my God, so many moments. Also, unfortunately, I don't know that any of those moments I like had the experience and in the same moment was like, wow, what a great learning experience. <laughs> I think in the moment I was like, this sucks, I'm mad. But I think there are two things, there are two big ones. One is when I left Deutsche Bank, which like I, you know, I, I gave a lot of flack to working in an environment like that, but I had great experiences too. And, you know, it allowed me to do a lot of stuff in my life. Um, 
I had like such an, in, because I was a high performer and like, you know, I got a lot of like pats on the head and like a lot of ego stuff. I truly thought that it would matter that I left that place. Mm. It did not. Like mm. it is an 80,000 person company. Deutsche Bank is fine without like a 28 year old VP who is leaving. And I had such an inflated sense of like who I was and what I was doing that even though people were like, oh, that's really sad. And we hope you come back after you travel for a year and blah, 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 blah. I was really like, oh, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares. They're going to be fine. So like that was a moment I think of, of, of realization about what working in a really big company is, is mm. like, you know, it's like, it's like putting your hand in a bucket of water. And when you pull your hand out, like the water will resettle. It'll be fine. And then the other big moment that I have um, really, that's probably like some baggage that I've had to work on is I worked for a company where when I joined, there was a lot of promise around equity and ownership. And it was early days and things were informal and there were personal relationships and things weren't in writing. And when push really came to shove, and the and the contracts were presented it did not line up with what had been originally discussed and i think um you know i think in my in my org design work a lot of times we talk about like principles like what is it that you want and practices of like what are you actually doing day to day and that felt like a real learning to me of like there was a principle here of like, oh, we're going to have shared ownership and you're going to help build this business and you're going to reap the rewards of that. But the practice was, you know, you're going to have like 0.1% of this company that you are, you know, sinking your time and energy and love into. And so, um, you know, I don't think the lesson from that was like, <laughs> get it signed uh, and notarized and looked at by a lawyer or don't do it at all. But it certainly has made me conscious of like, not letting things be implicit for too long and making sure that like when we say shared ownership, like, do we mean 50, 50, do we mean 10, 90? What do we actually mean by that? Um, and, and, and also just like writing things down, like writing things down is the easiest way in a complex environment to be like, do we mean the same thing for real? Or is this all very open to interpretation? Yeah. I love that. I think it's, well, when we say like being on the same page, it is yeah. literal. Like this, this is the page. <laughs> what what does it say? And um, yeah. I think it's a good reflection for our listeners. If you are the CEO or other dangling the carrot of ownership or some version of that, recognize that there's an impact. You got to talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. And if you don't live up to your promises implied or interpreted that it'll create some impact on your team. So just be aware yeah. of the things that you say, what, how they're interpreted. And if you're, you know, standing by them, cause that's, you could have a great structure, but if you don't have the backbone, it's not going to help you. So uh, Rodney, I'm sure we could talk for many, many hours, but I think this is the end for today. Uh, where can people learn more about the ready? Where can they connect with you to talk about ego or anything else that you want to discuss? Sure. So theready.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, Rodney Evans 919. That's a North Carolina area code. Uh, or listen to our podcast, Brave New Work, anywhere you get your podcasts. Excellent. Rodney, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I just look forward to the next time. And I'm going to check out the ready. And I've got a lot of things to think about in terms of organizational design and how to make people feel the pain that they know is there, but they not might not be able to put a word to it. So thanks for joining us today. This was a blast. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Folks, my guest today, Rodney Evans, who is the partner at the Ready podcast host as well. You can tell by her amazing studio. Appreciate you joining us today. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and I look forward to sharing with you on our next episode. See you next time.